let's see what else we okay. got. So ditto. Um, I think I you'll saw. like this one. So yep. Ditto's tagline is it's a tool for teams to manage copy from design to production. So copy is something we've talked about. Um, I also, I always define copy because I remember when I first moved to San Francisco and got a job in tech and then somebody asked me, can you give me some copy? And I didn't know what the hell they're talking about. I thought maybe they said coffee. Maybe I had to go make a copy of something. <laughs> I didn't know what copywriting meant. So copywriting is just like the words on a website, the words on your, on your, your product. Um, it's, it's a very vague word. Yeah. So, so anyways, what these guys did was they said, all right, we have all these tools like Figma, um, you know, Photoshop, whatever we have Google docs, spreadsheets. So we have all these collaborative, well-made SaaS tools that help us collaborate on design or on engineering or on, uh, modeling and on, in Excel. And so, um, why isn't there a tool that helps teams collaborate on their copy? And so they basically built a tool that says, you know, their, their pitch, which I think is, you would agree with is, Copy is the most under leveraged aspect of product building. It has a higher ROI and is easier to change than almost any other part of your product and can drive sales faster with better copy, which I agree with. And um, what they're saying is that teams don't have a great way right now to collaborate on your copy. And so they built a tool that lets you sort of point and click and make suggestions of what the copy could be or should be, or look at what it was before that sort of thing um, on the product. I don't, the product's not super clear exactly what it is, but I like the no. price. I, I think it's interesting. Okay, but let's talk about this. The the people. Okay, the people who started it. Um, one of the women. Oh, they're young, but okay. Ooh, they they said they came from venture capital. They were like interns at VC. So right. I was gonna say, wow, they're really young. Their first jobs before this were interns. Um, good for them. So I uh, believe their claim. We think copy will be the new visual design. I think that's. I think that's true. I think design got super important over the last 10 years. Um, and now every company just sort of knows that, hey, design is super important. Usability, UI, UX is super important. And well, nobody talks but, about copy. It's not the fucking new version of that. It always has been. It just, people just are It's not silly. in vogue in tech companies. Yeah. Like, I'm at a tech company of 2,000 people. I don't think I've heard the word copy once. I don't think anybody has a strategy to make our emails better or are the text on our website better? You know, it's very but this rare isn't gonna, I don't. This won't do that, though. This is like saying Figma is going to make your website look better. Yeah, that's true. You know, the tool, I think if you make it easier to do, people do do it more. But right now, the problem is people aren't um, aware or sort of considering this as something they need to be focused on. So, yeah, they, they need to educate the, markets of, of the market of the importance of copy first and then of having an easy tool second. I think it's cool. I think it looks great. There's one red flag that I have, which is their, like uh, the pricing is $12 a person a month. Um, right. I, it's going to be, it's hard to build something big when it's so cheap. You really need a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Right. Um, I mean, they'll need a, you know, a million users at that rate or not a million, yeah. but you know, a lot, maybe, a, well, yeah, a million users to be like really large. Um, so I think their pricing is silly, but they might be able to figure it out. Um, great idea. I like the idea, but it's not there yet. But I think that if you wanted to bet on them, it's an interesting bet. So here's something interesting. Have you ever read this blog post by Stuart Butterfield called, we don't sell saddles here? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's old. It's old. It's so Stuart Butterfield is the founder of Slack and, um, before they launched Slack, he wrote this memo to the team and he released it later. And what he said was, uh, he wrote this blog post, it's great. If you're a founder, you should go read this. And I'll, I'll summarize it very shortly. So we don't sell saddles here. What, what does that mean? So he talks about, let's assume you were a saddle company. You make saddles and you sell them. And so you could make saddles, sell them to existing horseback riders and basically try to tell them why their, their old saddle that they use is not great and how they should be using your saddle. And that's tough because A, you've got to get people to switch and B, um, there's just not that many people who, who are horseback riders today. And um, he goes, you know, the better approach and the reason he says we don't sell saddles here, even though we're a saddle company, is that what we need to do is sell the joy of horseback riding. If we can make people want a horseback ride, we can tell them how about how awesome it is to ride horses, how it's fun, how it's great exercise, how it feels great to have the wind blowing in your hair, then they'll want to do it. And when they do it, they'll be like, oh shit, I need a saddle. And it's like, don't worry, we got you. 
Um, and he basically says, this is the Lululemon approach. So Lululemon doesn't go, didn't go to a very small, at the time, yoga industry and say, hey, you should be buying $100, you know, yoga pants. What they did was they helped spread the joy of the, of the sort of the lifestyle of a yoga lifestyle. Um, they got more people to want to do it. That's why they offer yoga classes in their store. Like who does that? Um, they want people to be in that lifestyle. And then once you're in the lifestyle, it's like, do you want the best? Because we, we do have the best materials. And so this is just a general strategy. If you're, if you're operating in a niche, sometimes you have to actually sell the lifestyle of being in that niche more than your product to the existing people in the niche. I love that. And did, and a lot of times, not a lot of times, every once in a while, those like marketing things, like in those selling the lifestyle actually becomes bigger than the original thing. So for example, this is an example where one has become bigger, but it's become its own, its own thing. You know, Michelin star restaurants. Okay. Yeah. You heard of Michelin star restaurants. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's like the standard of what is good. Yeah, and what fine is good. dining. Yeah. Well, you know, Michelin tires created that. And right. they, they did it because they created a guide on which restaurant, like this they Michelin has been around since this car started. It was around even before that they made rubber for all types of things. And then cars got popular and it was, you guys need to get out and travel the world and you need to right. see all these amazing <laughs> things and look at right. all these restaurants. This one, we rate this one, one star. You should go see it, but this one's four star. You have to go see it. And if you do happen to go see it, make sure that you use our tires. Right. <laughs> How are you going to get there? You better drive. If you're going to drive, you better have tires. <laughs> right. And, and, and that was, that's how Michelin star, uh, Michelin stars got started. And there's a whole bunch of examples like that where right. uh, these marketing schemes have become their own, their own right. thing. So anyway, um, what's it called again? Ditto. So ditto. I think they're going to have to do that. I think they're going to have to not sell saddles. I think they're going to have to sell horseback riding first. And, Okay, so the, it, it, these people who are starting it are pretty young. Let's see if they're like aggressive enough to do this. And I, maybe they, they might be able to, but selling copy is really easy. Like if I, if I, like I could just go to you, I could say, like, look, you give me a blank piece of paper. And because I have this skill set, I'm an ATM. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, like if just, or like there's like this uh, there's this very famous copywriting story of this very uh, of this copywriter who sees a guy who uh, is ho a homeless guy who's holding a, s a sign and he says I'm blind please help me um, and he goes and the copywriter goes up to the guy he goes hey let me help you out here and he just writes it's beautiful outside comma and then it fills in and I'm blind please help Interesting. And the whole point is like, dude, if you just add two or three words, it changes everything. Right. And so these people, ditto, their ad campaigns could be really good. So yeah, um, good point. I'm on board. Can I tell a quick story about, uh, and we're totally off the YC train for a second, but I, this, That's this right. is a fun thing I just remember when you told that story. So my very first company, um, we had no money. We, we were funding the whole thing off prize money. So I would be going out like a like a busker pitching at, at startup competitions, trying to win them. And every, every time we won, we got more money to keep going. And um, I don't know why we didn't just pitch investors, but like it was working. So we just kept doing it. So we didn't have a lot of money to hire anybody, but we, reali we realized, hey, we were right next to the University of Boulder and we could get a bunch of interns. And the question was, how do we pick which interns? Uh, how do we know who's good? So I was like, all right, we're gonna design a test, a case. And so the case we gave them was, and so we wanted a marketing intern. And I said, hey, you know, near the university, there's a, this sort of a homeless population. Um, and they, you know, let's say today they all earn on average uh, 50 bucks a day. Let's say that's what they're making today. So your challenge to show me your marketing skills, your savvy, your instincts. Um, I want you to come back and I want you to basically pitch me a plan. The idea was for them to actually go do it, but we never ended, we never ended up having them actually go do it. But we said, come up with a plan of, how, of how you would earn the most money in a given week. So what would you, where would you stand? So this was about like understanding locations, foot traffic, which is like essential for restaurants. So where would you pick that you were gonna go? What would you write on your sign? How would your image look? What would you, what would be your sort of your, your, your look? And uh, why do you believe that that would be the most effective way to get money? And this was our, our sort of test as a little bit like not, not politically correct, but, um, 
uh, there was one girl who had a, who had a uh, she had a good solution where she was like uh, I don't remember all the details, but it was like oh I'm gonna go to this area because this type of person is uh, she was like first I wanted to figure out who is the type that donates, and so she's like first I would observe which type of person I'd spend the first day just observing which type of person donates, and I was like that's smart. Um, understand the customer first before you implement your plan. And then she was like, okay. And then after that, I'm going to, um, you, you know, I would target where that person's commute is. I would be there. And then I would have a positive message because I believe that the positive messages will sell better than the sort of the, the negative uh, messages. And I would try to tug at people's heartstrings. So I'd go for emotion and not logic on, on why it can help, but that, you know, I'm struggling and I'm a mother or whatever it is. And like, that's why people donate. So yeah, uh, and it just proves how important copy is. And copy is not words. Copy is understanding how people think and communicating it effectively. And it just so happens it often is used with words. Right. Okay, and cool. spe Let's... speaking of copy, farm theory, that is an <laughs> example of copy. So you have farm theory on here, which is yeah. selling ugly produce to restaurants in India. Yes. Is that a YC thing? It's a YC company. Yes. Uh, it's okay, in so India. And that's a company in America. And what's it called? No, no, it's in, it's in India. So it's Farm Theory. No, it, it, oh, there is also that. one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a there's like a farm to table box. I think that's the ugly produce thing in America. I forgot what it's called. It, me too. I just googled it. So, Imperfect so you, Foods. Yeah, Imperfect Foods. So I'll I'll give you the stats on these guys. So um, so they're doing twenty two thousand a month uh, of MRR. They um, say 40% profit margins. They say they're growing 65% week on week, which doesn't mean anything because it's YC, but they're on track to get to a million dollars ARR in the coming months. What they're doing is interesting. They're taking, um, farming is huge in India. So they're saying, okay, there's tons of farming. There's tons of produce produced. There's tons that's not going to get sold because it looks ugly. It's not good for consumer retail, but we could buy that stuff for cheap because it's just waste otherwise. We can sell it to restaurants who don't care about the aesthetic look of the, you know, they're not picking like a consumer does in the, in the grocery store where they pick a, you know, the best looking one out of a barrel. Uh, the restaurants don't care. They're chopping it up, processing it, turning it into food. If they can get lower food costs, fantastic. And so they're looking at, um, you know, right now it's $720 a month just for the restaurants in Bangalore, which is a part of India. And uh, they're, they believe it's a big market. They, they claim a $500 million market just in Bangalore. Uh, just through the restaurants that are there. Sounds a little high to me, but um, the, the value prop makes sense. The restaurant saves about 30% by buying ugly produce. The farm gets some revenue out of something that would otherwise be no revenue. And uh, they take their cut in the middle. I like it. What do you think? I, I like it now, but let me, I'm always being like the negative guy. I like <laughs> it, but let me tell you, okay, I'm a subscriber to Imperfect Produce. Um, First of all, it's not imperfect. Like th this is a shtick of the of uh, farm theory of them selling like things that are ugly. So what are you saying? They they look normal. You're saying? Yeah, it looks normal. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't look like it's a it, it's a wonderful marketing scheme, but it, it's it, it's so like it's just normal shit, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> because and, I'm guessing you would not sign up for something that just says here's vegetable delivery. Correct. <laughs> yes. It's like saying,